Well, welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another All Things of Venia. Uh, I am very, very pleased today. This is going to be a really fun conversation because my boss, the one and only... No Mark pressure. Harper, ...is here today. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. We just thought, you know, this was... Um, for the last few months now, we've been tackling different topics, whether they're directly wine-related or something that's sort of connected to a venia. But this time, we really wanted to focus on us, on our story, um, and bring in, you know, the, our original managing partner here, Marty, to, to chime in and, and also to announce a pretty fun new labeling project. Um, and we're going to taste a really cool library wine. So there's a lot of stuff to get to, but Marty, I just wanted you to sort of say hello, introduce yourself to everybody, uh, and then we'll get started. Thanks, Eli. Hey, hey, everyone. Hi, uh, Marty, uh, uh, talker. Chris and I uh, had the fortune of meeting each other in 2009 when I was a crush intern at DeLille. Um, and um, I was pursuing a path that, that um, I was interested in getting in the wine business and uh, was interested in, you know, how to start a winery and how to do that. And um, started studying at South Seattle Community College. And then I met uh, Chris when I was a harvest intern and we, we started a vineyard in 2010. And uh, uh, you know, it's after a 20 some year career in technology, Microsoft, and then 10 years is kind of a, a marketing consultant and father and dad and retired software guy. Uh, it was really fun to get back into my own thing. And that's where, um, that's where Avenia was kind of created back then. And it's uh, it's been a really fun ride. And, uh, uh, you know, we've really had a great time building building this business. And uh, I think we've delivered some pretty outstanding products to a lot of people around the United States and in some cases uh, internationally. So it's been a fun ride and um, uh, really enjoyed it so far. We're fortunate we've got great growers we work with. Uh, we've got great employees um, that um, have chosen to honor us by working for us. And um, I have a terrific partner in Chris, who's uh, I learned something from just about every time I sit down with him. So it's been a great journey so far and uh, lots of exciting things ahead. And uh, one of the things we'll be talking about in a little bit is it's kind of a, a little celebration for our journey so far. So, yeah. Well, before we get to that, though, I have a couple questions just about your about that original time. So I, I hear Chris's side of the story, I guess, more often, you know, like, oh, here's this guy, Marty was an intern and had this business plan for a winery, knew a lot about wine, and we, we just hit it off and drank a beer together and boom, Avenia happened. Yeah, but, wow, uh, sounds good to me. <laughs> that's more or less true. But I had a question for you, Marty, which is, had you, were you, how long at that point were you sort of looking um, to be able to invest and start a winery and, and partner with a winemaker. And were there other winemakers you were considering at the time, or was it more of like a chance happenstance uh, situation where you, you and Chris just clicked? Oh, that's a great, great, great set of questions. Um, you know, I had the really good fortune of being at Microsoft in the eighties and the nineties. And um, I learned a lot about marketing and branding and how to build a community and how to, how to, uh, you know, uh, you know, learn how to inf influence people into your point of view, how to how to talk to, you know, your, your the core audiences for a new product and get them. So a lot of the marketing techniques that 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 uh, I could uh, that I ended up applying to what we're doing at Avenia, I learned back in those days. And so uh, being there in the 80s and the 90s and 99 came. And if anybody remembers, that was kind of the big froth, the big bubble. Um, I had the opportunity to step away from from Microsoft then and, and pursue a lot of different things. And, you know, one of the things I thought I'd be really interesting for me to do was consulting, you know? And so in consulting, you have people that bring you in, they tell you their problems, you write a, write, you know, a PowerPoint deck, you kind of help them, um, you know, think through issues and opportunities. Then you present this plan to them, then they completely ignore it. And then they pay you and you walk out the door and says, geez, that was not much fun. And that happened to me two or three times. I'd also get involved in startups where, you know, I was just a small part of the action and I really didn't have total control over the process. And I'm not a technology guy. I'm not, in no way do I, I think I've written one line of basic in my life and I, and I had to debug it three times before I got it to work. And so um, and I clearly wasn't gonna start a technology company. And so I, I decided I really wanted to be involved in a business where I could actually put my hands on the product. I could actually 
be involved in the in the making of it and hand it to somebody. And um, you know, since my wife Colleen and I have been traveling the world for wines over the years, and I had a little bit of a wine collection, I discovered Quilcita Creek and Andrew Will back in the eighties, and I'd enjoyed those wines. And we traveled in France a few times, and you know, the whole wine culture and and the wine. It's probably not right to call it like lifestyle, but the but the opportunity to have a life that involves friends and family and meals and travel and entertainment and wine. It just, that's just suits kind of my personality. And so I wasn't going to start a technology company. I wasn't going to be a professional golfer. I'm a crappy skier and I wasn't a good enough drummer. And so why not get in the wine business? And so um, um, I says, well, that, that could work. Cause I, I, I'd met a lot of Washington winemakers who started off as, you know, uh, uh, a psalm at a restaurant, or they'd been the wine salesperson at Larry's Market. Everybody, anybody remember Larry's Market? Or they've done, you know, they, they kind of get into the wine business kind of in a, in 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 not a really uh, considered way. So I says, well, let's learn about the wine business. So um, I found the South Seattle um, uh, program. I really enjoyed that. I started working with Reggie, who was the director down there, and she was encouraging. And um, but since I started late in January 2009, I couldn't. Uh, get in the actual winemaking portion that that fall, and so I would have to wait a year to get in until uh, fall of 2010 to actually be in the program. And so I said, "Hey, Reggie, I don't really want to wait that long. I mean, I'm I was 55 at the time. I didn't have much time left, and so I had to get going on this thing." And and um, um, and so she says, "We'll go intern somewhere. That's the best way to learn, really." And it's kind of fun, is that you know one of my other buddies at Microsoft. Uh, he had interned at DeLille the previous year and he was telling me about it. And he says, well, go, go see Chris. And so I wrote out a resume. I put on some nice clothes. I interviewed with Chris at DeLille's Chateau and I come walking in and here's my, here's my resume. Here I am. I'm very serious. And, and he kind of looks at me and goes, man. Okay. So he hired me and um, I, I, I committed that I wouldn't quit. Cause I guess a lot of us older interns tend to work about two weeks and then we just fry out and, crash and burn and don't come back but I, I stuck stuck through it and I really really loved it I really had a blast um, you know it, it's really really hard work I mean and I, I've never really been afraid of hard work I guess but you look at you know the punch downs and my primary job the first three weeks of crush was I my job was rinsing out the white the blue bins because the little harvested all their fruit in these little blue bins somebody dump them they go on the on the sorting table and then somebody have to rinse them out and stack them up well that's what I did for, for three weeks with a hose and the, and, and we'd get, you know, hundreds of bins and, you know, it was, that was my introduction to winemaking, rinsing blue bins. But as part of that, there's always the time that you're not in crush where you're, you're, you're learning about the fermentation, you're doing the punch downs, you're smelling the fermenters all through. I mean, just the whole mystique of the process, just how it, how wines evolve. And Chris was kind of leading me through the process and we'd taste uh, wine coming out of the press, going into the barrel. We'd taste wine that had been barrel for a year. Um, most crush interns just stay through harvest um, and are done by November or something like that. But I stayed on three days a week past harvest as just to just to learn the process. So, you know, after you get done with harvest, you have the racking. And after you have the racking, you have the blending, you have the maturing of the barrels. All that stuff was really fascinating to me. And the more uh, I, I, uh, I did that stuff, the more excited I got about it. And so um, all during this process, I was still going to school, and one of the classes I had to take was uh, wine business planning. And as part of that, I, I wrote a business plan. And you know, being a Microsoft guy, you know, I had PowerPoint, I had Word, I had Excel, I had all the tools. Man, I put together this really fantastic thing. And Chris was kind of going, you know, how serious is this guy? So I, and he goes, well, why don't you show me your plan? And so I shared the plan with him, and he looked at it and says, yeah, you, you, you really thought about a lot of things, and he liked what I thought about. What my ambitions were and my one of my ambitions was to create a winery of note or impact one that wasn't just going to be uh you know a kind of a side project for a yet another retired software guy i wanted to create a brand and i wanted to create um a following and i wanted to be a we wanted to be you know recognized as one of the significant wineries in washington state which is you know you said i goal and um and chris said i think all your plans are solid you know about the kind of investment you need to make you know about all these uh, other aspects, but there's two things you don't, I, I think you need to think about. One, you have to think about how you're gonna access the best fruit because 
you know, you're just not going to walk in the door and get, uh, you know, the best fruit in Washington State, you know, just, you know, being a crush intern at DeLille for one, for three months, nobody's going to sell you the fruit that you really want. And two, with all due respect, you probably don't know enough about winemaking to make the kinds of wines that you would want to make, uh, being a crush intern at DeLille for three months. And I go, yeah, those are, those are problems. I, you're right. That, that could be a fatal flaw in my plan. And he goes, I might have a solution to that. And he goes, what's that? And I go, what's that? He says, well, how about I join you? And I go, really? You'd be interested in leaving this cushy job at DeLille, one of the top wineries in Washington state to take a leap of faith with this, you know, guy who knows nothing about the wine business. And Chris says, yeah, I'm looking for an opportunity. And if you're committed to making more than four barrels of wine in your basement and not putting your dog on the label, I'm in. And I go, okay, well, let's do it. So we worked throughout the winter and spring. He's going to deny all this. Of course, this is my version of the story. But anyway, all, all the, until about June, we hammered out an agreement. You know, we figured out how we could work together. We kind of had a good idea what I, my strengths were and what, what, my, what his strengths were and how we could combine them. And uh, June 1st, we were off and running. And, um, you know, first thing we did was we drove out to the vineyards and we saw Dick Boucher, uh, Kent Walliser, and Mike Sauer. Um, Boucher Vineyards, Sagemore, and Red Willow, respectively. And, um, you know, they, they, we got an audience with them and I told them what the plan was. And um, they all said, well, that sounds really interesting. Um, but if, if you're working with this guy, then we'll work with you. I go, okay. Great. So they all gave us fruit our first vintage, 2010. Well, I was going to say, so that, that's actually a perfect segue because I asked Marty before this, I'm like, hey, will you grab a wine from your library? Because it'd be fun to taste one of our older vintages. And he's like, oh yeah, how about a, you know, 2010 Sestina? And I was like, great, because it gives me the excuse to grab one from our library up here at the <laughs> booth and divvy it out to everyone so that we could actually taste it. And I could tell you, Marty, the whole team tasted it and it's just tasting awesome. I hope your bottle is also tasting awesome. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm about pouring it right now. Oh, good. The, the I have I have my wife and our friends in the next room. We're I think we're grilling some steaks tonight for dinner. Oh. But this bottle will be gone by the time they get. Yeah, totally. So yeah, so this is from the first vintage, 2010. Yeah. Christina here. This is the it. It says red wine on on the bottle, which it absolutely is. But it's a Cabernet Sauvignon dominant Bordeaux style blend, and this is. This first year, Chris was saying mm -hmm. it was just from, from Bacchus Vineyard and Red Willow, right? There was, it was before we got the Dionysus Cab Block. Um, so it was just those two vineyards, but incredible vines. And just, it's really fun to see now how this is aging 10 years, 10 years down the road. Did this have any Red Willow in it? I mean, not Red Willow. I mean, uh, uh, Clipson. Did we have any Clipson the first year? He said it was it was just Bacchus and Red okay. Willow. Yeah. Okay. That's but cool. It, it's, tasting, it's tasting great. Yeah. When, when I came into the project, you know, Chris, Chris has spent the time in, um, in the Rhone Valley in college and was really a fan of the Rhone wines. And I was uh, the first, first, literally the first case of wine I bought as a collector was Lynch Bosch, which I read about in the 19, uh, I think, 87 issue of Wine Spectator, which I just started subscribing to. It was the 1985 vintage. And I, I just fell in love with the Lynch Bosch, which was, was the wine of the year. And it was on the cover. And I go, well, that looks like cool wine. I think I paid $36 a bottle for it. Wow. wow, so expensive. And um, and so I really love Bordeaux, especially Puyac. I love the wines from that region of Bordeaux. And and Chris says, I think we can not do those wines, but we can certainly um, represent that fruit well with Washington, with what Washington can produce in the vineyards. And he's delivered uh, on that with Sestina year in, year out. And I just am such a huge fan of this wine. Um, and... Uh, well, this, love, love this is, it. it's so great. And it's, it, now it's fun to, you know, both taste this first vintage, talk about your background and, and like when we brought Chris into the picture. But then I guess the other thing I was really hoping to talk to you about and our surprise guest was the name of Venia, this whole branding, the design of everything. Like it's, it's, it's a pretty crucial relationship, I think, in any business where you have to market a product is, is your designer or your um, the art side of things. So, uh, without further ado, I'm hoping to bring in our good friend here, Joe Chauncey. Hey, Joe. Hey, Eli. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're here today. So, Joe Chauncey, for everyone, uh, works with. I'm going to make him a co-host right now, just 
good one. That was... And Joe hasn't been sent to the woodshed. I just want everyone to know that. That's his that's his stu he's studio not... background there. He's, he's, he, he's not been yeah, sent These to are the all woodshed. real tools. I use them. <laughs> <laughs> it's not one of those fake backgrounds. Right. There you go. So Joe, I'm hoping uh, you could just sort of give people a little background for yourself and maybe in, you know, how, how you got both into design and architecture, but then specifically started working with wineries uh, here in Washington? Yeah, um, that's, that's a great question. It, it, it was a very purposeful um, step for me. I had learned over owning a firm for a long time that um, you have to commit and write things down and tell everybody that you're going to do something. So in 2000, excuse me, 1999, um, at, a, at a firm retreat, by the way, uh, I am one of the owners and partners in a design firm, and we help people through collaboration realize their dreams for uh, houses and wineries and tasting rooms and medical buildings and so on, as well as branding and package design. Um, but the branding and package design and wineries came in 1999 when I committed to my staff that we would have a project in the wine industry within one year. And then I set out to make, to make a plan on how that would happen. And uh, within one year, we landed our first project. And um, we started with wineries. And then two years later, one of the first wineries we designed said, I'm looking for a, for a branding and package design person. Can you help me find someone? And I had become friends with this client and I said, why don't you give me a crack at it? I'd like to try branding and package design. And he said, okay, I'll give you a crack at it. So we did our first label two years later. And so now fast forward, here we are uh, 20 years after that. And we've been doing wineries and tasting rooms and package design and branding ever since that time. And I love it. I'm 71 years old and I haven't slowed down yet. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so, so, so for Avenia, the, the cool thing about Avenia was that um, it's always been from its inception, an idea that was grounded in old world and new world and somehow marrying those two. And uh, Eli, you may not know this, but the original concept for the winery, the brand name was, was maybe going to be Sestina. I actually, yeah. it's funny, I did know that. And the only reason I do is because when you go out to check our mailbox, it actually says Sestina written in marker in the mailbox. <laughs> So I think that was how it was originally set up at our property. And then yeah. I, think, I think Marty actually told me that uh, last year. <laughs> yeah, then we, we got rejected for the trademark and, and because of the, the cyst, some, some Italian winery had a cyst, Sistine Chapel rendering, you know, with the hand of God touching yeah. mankind. Yeah, S-I-S-T-I-N-A. Yeah, and so we couldn't, we couldn't get it trademarked. Um, but the cool part about it was that it became a great proprietary name for your top tier yeah. Bordeaux. Which fanciful, is fanciful name, fanciful name. Yeah. That's fanciful. <laughs> and um, so favor fell on the Avenia brand, which many of you probably know is an ancient form of the, of the name of the city Avignon, which is the center of one of the most notable wine regions in France and probably the world. Um, but Sestina continued on as having a branding influence. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a sestina is, it's a old form of French verse uh, that was used by wandering troubadours to tell stories from village to village. And it's a six stanza, six line verse with a triplet at the end, and then lines repeat every six stanzas. So it's pretty complex. And uh, the people in 12th century France got used to listening to stories like this. And one of the most famous troubadours that told these stories was named Arnaud. And our research showed that, that um, he was probably the best troubadour and the most noted troubadour of all time. So Marty and Chris said, why don't, why don't we name our top tier Syrah from Boucher Vineyards, Arnaud? And we were off to the races. We had two, two proprietary fanciful names and a brand name. In a, in a fairly short period of time, which was just great. The, the, the other thing that happened is that six repeating became the number of vines that we put on the label and part of the brand mark. So we further anchored it in old world France. So we've got six vines behind the, the brand name of Enya. 
I'm glad you said that, Joe. I'm gonna share my screen right now so people can see this, uh, just sort of the full, full on design there. Yeah, we would, yeah, the yeah. there were six finds actually. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I taught you something today. I don't really t ever teach Marty very much, but I'm glad I taught him. <laughs> I've always, well, I can I've tell you, I can tell you this, Joe, is that um, yeah, I, I, we we interviewed three or four different uh, branding agencies, and when we sat down with Joe, we really felt we kind of had a soulmate. He kind of, you know, he was kind of, uh, you know, sort of my generation, um, and uh, you know, was really thoughtful. And and the thing that that I've enjoyed over the years, and this is what's really been cool about working with Joe and Chris, is that you know, I, I'm kind of a business guy. And a marketing guy and i have enormous respect for the creative aspects of what we do from a business standpoint and so being able to re understand appreciate and really give creative people like chris and joe the room to to just do what they do so well has really uh been one of one of the great in, uh, passions of my life and what i've really enjoyed i've really enjoyed being around creative people and that's why i enjoy music it's why i enjoy art and and when you're able to combine you know sort of the art of winemaking and the art of packaging and the art of design into something that you could call your own it's really really exciting so uh, joe has been such a fantastic partner for the winery over the years and such a terrific collaborator um you know we just i just don't think we'd be where we are today without kind of his his insight and visions on on what we do so uh it's beautiful stuff. It's really fun stuff. It's 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 really unique and different, and really, I think it sets us sets us apart out there. So, Appreciate thank you, Mister. Thank you, Mister yeah. Chauncey. <laughs> yeah. well, what's really fun this year is, you know, Marty. I don't know oh. if you want to announce our our little slight label change for the upcoming vintage. Yeah, I don't know if anybody, you know, we we're talking a lot about 2010, but this week we bottled our tenth vintage, um, and I, I can't believe. Um, you know, I still feel like I'm 55, going on 56, going on 66. Um, but we had, you know, I thought, well, you know, I want to celebrate this a little bit. What's the best way to celebrate? We, we're, we're doing special, what I'm calling collector labels of all of our, all the wines that we've been making for 10 years. And, and these are the four wines. Now, uh, you can see that Joe has, and, and so we gave Joe the task of saying, hey, what can we do? And so he came up with this really cool. So all of our 2019 vintage wines are going to have this special 10th, 10th label on them. And I'm pretty, pretty pumped about them. Uh, we did, in, 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 in the 2010 vintage, we did um, Arnaud, Sistina, Gravira, and then one wine that didn't make the cut after that first year was Parapine. Mm -hmm. um, but in 2011, we did uh, Olean, and it's celebrating its 10th anniversary this year because we bottled the 20 vintage. And so um, these are the labels, and um, we'll be doing a lot of a lot more promotion as we get closer to the release of Arno in September. But I'm pretty excited about the wines, and I don't know, I don't know, Eli, if you got a vi video of the Olean being bottled on the. Yeah, on, I was just gonna on, say I got this. They were just running down the line on Tuesday. Um. So cool. That's so cool. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. they Looks turned great. out great. They turned <laughs> yeah. out great. I mean, I think I think as we Marty, you and I talked about this, and I know you you really believe in it. A good portion of good branding is about the story. And even though you don't tell the story every day, if you if you ground your brand in a with a story, it feels just like it has a strength to fly on its own. And I think these the vines became as strong a brand image as the word of Inia, which enabled us to pull all that other stuff off the front label and put it on the back and make this cool uh, celebration label. So I think it's working out pretty well. Yeah. And it's, I mean, we use it all over the place and it's, it's definitely been a, a super successful for us. And it is really recognizable. I mean, it's, I think it has such an elegance to it, which is what I've always loved about it. And even, even when you look at pictures of our 
tasting room, which for those of you that don't know, Joe also had his hand in. Let's see. Yeah, it's kind of like a, a Vinia bottle blown up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the fun part about this project, was it was in an, a, um, a shell of a building. Uh, the roof and the, and the ceiling and the floor were there and the walls were kind of, uh, the, the outside walls were she, uh, not sheetrocked. And uh, so it gave us a little bit of latitude of what we could do in here. And one of the things tasting rooms have a problem with is uh, they get pretty loud when you have as many customers as, as Marty and Chris and Eli have. Uh, so that back panel here where the word of Inia is, you see it's got vines painted on it. That's actually a product called Tecta made from recycled um, uh, uh, pulp from trees that are left over as a byproduct from making other products. And it's spun and it absorbs sound. And the same thing is used all across the back left-hand side where the bottles are hanging. And when we talked to Marty and Chris and uh, about how we were gonna display the bottles, uh, they wanted to have enough so that they could uh, pull wines for, for sales. But we thought that we wanted to elevate the wine, individual bottles of wine to make it almost like a piece of art. So each one of these bottles is suspended on a steel post with a collar that is uh, screwed around the neck and it, it hovers away from the back wall. And they're all lit up above. You can see the lighting system there. The other thing that we wanted to do in, this, in the tasting room is reduce the, um, the barrier if you will, between the person serving and the person tasting. So, you know, most tasting rooms have, have an elevated serving counter and we lowered it all down to one height so that they're on a, the taster is on an equal footing with the server. Yeah, the feeling is that you're gathering around someone's kitchen or dining room and having a conversation versus yeah. going to a bar and yeah, Joe, Joe really did a fantastic idea, fantastic concept of translating the tasting room into, or our brand idea into the tasting room thing, tasting room building. So yeah. great stuff. Joe is also the, the, the brains behind our liminal branding. If you, those of you who are familiar with our new high-end weather eye related project, and then also our Lydian um, project. And so um, I really love the packaging on liminal. Um, you know, I think our staff, uh, you know, really enjoys putting together these cardboard boxes. Uh, so I know that they're they're having a blast with those. Um, but I think the packaging, the presentation of those ones, really speaks to the quality of that that effort. And then uh, the Lydian thing is our 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 value brand, and it's a fun, uh, you know, homage to kind of our musical in interests. And uh, Eli's been pretty instrumental in. To say instrumental, that's great. Yeah, you like that? <laughs> well, your voice is an instrument, Eli, so I think that works. <laughs> no, you, you wrote this little song here, Eli. I was gonna say, at least I did use an instrument. I, I wrote that music on the label on the piano, so it wasn't, it wasn't just my voice. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun, though. I mean, even just speaking personally, I've never been involved with branding or, or any sort of design. And going through the whole process all the way from the beginning when we didn't have a name for this second label and bouncing around different ideas and different musical things and seeing what Joe did with it was just so inspiring. It was so cool to see the evolution of this and then and to turn out like this. I just think was was super fun. Yeah, it's great stuff. Yeah, I really I, I really like the staff and how it it explodes like a jam session from a, from a really great jazz quintet. It just <laughs> it's a lot of fun yeah oh it's great i mean it's a lot of fun for me too because i think now technically i'm a published composer which i'm going to put on my resume that's true <laughs> i suppose i have to pay more for that don't i know that i know it's <laughs> oh man well this is great and so you know i was hoping uh at this point if any of you i know a lot of you maybe you have some questions for for marty maybe you have questions for joe about anything about how Avenia was started about design elements. 
Um, now would be a time if you're interested, you can unmute and ask a question. You could use the chat box if you're interested in asking questions for, for these guys. Um, and we'll, we'll keep the conversation going from there. I'm just, it's so, oh, well, I, I have another question before. Oh, wait, yeah, Mark and Robin. Go for it. We had a question for Marty. Marty, uh, now that you've had a shot at this, uh, what would you do differently? Well, that's a good question. Um, You know, I think I think there there are just you have to be real more. You know, I'd be probably a little more realistic about budgets. I'd be a little more re realistic about the the investment required. I I might have invested in more um, um, uh, better uh, aging and fermentation infrastructure initially. I mean, we kind of were uh, shoestring operation the first two three years. We made our first two vintages over at FST Winery where we were hosted by them. And that and that worked great, but we were you know a small part of a big operation, and sometimes it felt a little chaotic. I think um, as we have matured as an organization, we've learned about the benefits of you know um, extended aging and concrete tanks and things like that. I might have might have built a business plan that allowed me to maybe advance some of the more uh, interesting techniques we're using now in the winemaking process. Um, um, I probably would have invested in um, hiring someone uh, earlier on the distribution side because we really struggled for the first five or six years really gaining any market share outside of Washington State and establishing presence. But in hindsight, it probably worked out fine, um, you know, because uh, I use this as an opportunity for me to learn a business. And sometimes um, when you learn a business, you make a lot of missteps and you don't do things absolutely, you know, optimized as well as you can. So. Uh, maybe bringing in an expert on the marketing and distribution side, I mean, sales and distribution side earlier might have been helpful. I don't think we hired Matt until we were like four years, five years down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, um, but no, I, I think, I think our, our, you know, and I probably would have uh, demonstrated more patience, um, you know, because, uh, you know, launching, it takes a long time to establish a brand. It takes a long time to get established. I mean, you know, I'm used to, you know, things just kind of happening in the software world. You just, things happen really quickly and you, and you cycle through products every nine to 18 months. And in the wine business, you've got this wine Sestina. And, you know, I consider it to be up there with one of the top red wines coming out of Washington state. I consider it to be as good as, uh, and, and I mean this with all due respect to my friend, you know, to our, our, our friends at Quilcita Creek and an Andrew Will and at Woodward Canyon and you know, all, all the fantastic wines that are out there. I think this wine is as good, if not you know, on par with those. And so, but I don't think it's recognized as that yet. And so I expected it because it's so good. I expected it to be, you know, happen sooner. And so I just am being patient. I'm just know that every vintage, you know, we get out there, we get more and more people who uh, find and discover the wines and appreciate it. And it becomes part of their cellar, it becomes part of their collection. And, that just takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to get people to discover you, to learn about your wines, to start collecting them and to start referring them to friends. And so uh, I think probably the, the, the one thing that I probably wish I'd had more of was patience and understanding that and, and be satisfied with, you know, being more patient. I don't know if there's, are those good answers, Eli? What, how yeah, did I do? Sounds good. sounds good to me. Thank you. I don't know, Joe, what did you learn? What did I learn that I should have learned sooner? <laughs> I, I do know that you've been surprised from time to time about the cost of things. I mean, you, 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 you've been knocked on the nose a couple of times. And um, I, th I don't think anybody really understands how much this costs. It's just, it's surprising. And how long you actually have to wait for there yeah. to be a return on the investment. I, I, I completely agree with you and I understand where you're coming from. So you just have to be patient. But the but the uh, end result is you know you have you have um, brands and you have wines that, that that have longevity. I mean these are we we are so blessed. We have four hundred club members now, and we just started the club program about three and a half years ago. And and these people they come back time and time again, and they talk about the wines with their friends. They share them with their families. They they are excited about a release coming up, and it's just it's so gratifying to see how 
enthusiastic they are. I mean, it used to be when I first started the winery, I, I, I love, I, I had a friend um, who, who actually owns some vineyards in Napa Valley and he, he did really well with Tommy Bahama. And I told him I was starting a winery and he goes, well, that's really interesting. What are you going to do when you sell all you <laughs> get done selling wine to all your friends? <laughs> and I go, well, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, those are the people who are definitely going to buy your wines or your friends. So he says, well, I got a couple hundred friends, I think. And so now I have four club members and I can probably only name, I probably only know personally 50 to 75 of them. And so it's, it's incredible, you know, the enormous uh, trust that these people have put in what Chris is doing and what we're doing and come back time and time again. We're so grateful and we're being rewarded by, um, you know, give, you know, by being patient on that. So I, just patience, just be patient. It's not an overnight success. That's for sure. Well, it's not an overnight success, except for when you release your first vintage of wines and one of them wins red wine of the year. Yeah, wine. well. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> or that quote from Sean Sullivan that says you couldn't have done any better if you'd been shot out of a cannon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got off to a good start, but you know, <laughs> that was really good for selling like 250 cases. Now we're, now we're selling, now we're making seven to 10,000 cases every year. We gotta be, yeah. Gotta stay out of it. Gotta keep going. Hey, Joe, I have a question for you. Uh -huh. um, it, I mean, and it sounds very simple, but I, I'm still interested. So I get a lot of questions about just simply this, about font, the design, the A, the, the backloaded A or whatever it is, and like the line. What, what were some of the thoughts from a design perspective? What were some of the thoughts, even just based on this, how you got this word to look the way it did? We had, we had multiple iterations of this. Um, some didn't have the taller initial A capital. They were the same size all the way across. And it really felt like it, it needed something to anchor the left-hand side when we ended up extending the horizontal stroke on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. And even though it's not really accurate, there's something about the A with the cross that feels... Um, like it's a like it is a literally a cross mm. it, um it, but it's a modern interpretation of a cross mm -hmm. we didn't want to use serif letters we wanted to use something in between a straight uh, non-serif and a serif letter for those of you that don't know a serif letter you see them and it usually has a, a a horizontal shelf on the top of each one of the of the v of the right leg of the n the left leg of the uh the bottom of the n and so on um, those are those are uh, too ornate. We wanted something that that once again spanned between old world and new world, and we felt like this did it. Yeah, I don't know if you know this, Joe, but Dan Brown has approached us about this the the topography for his next book. You know about you know the kind of the whole <laughs> Da Vinci Code part. Two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is good. this is all going to be the end. Of, yeah. It's, 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 it's going to be a big royalty check for us, so we're pretty excited about that. Oh, good. Oh. We don't have to be as patient anymore. That's yeah, exactly right. <laughs> yeah, did you, you, this... you did you invent this, Joe? Did you or, or this isn't this isn't a, a a typeface, right? You invented it, right? No, uh, it's a it's a modified typeface. We took a standard typeface and, and yeah. adjusted it. Yeah. yeah, and one of the one of the concept sketches. I think I've got one right here. I'm going to hold it up here just so you can see it. Where is it? Here we go. Can you all see that? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's part of an initial concept sketch. Oh yeah, yeah. I that with with the extended with the extended yeah, uh, with the extended. Bar. The first time we showed that to Marty and Chris was from that concept sketch. Interesting. Well, I've just, I've always just really enjoyed it. It's, I think it's one of the most elegant um, wine labels out there, at least that I see when I'm out and about perusing shelves and checking on things. So, Well, it definitely stands out from the rest of the pack on the shelf for sure. And, and granted, you guys don't have a lot of wine on shelves because you sell so much direct to consumer, but it still stands out when I see it. Yeah. Cool. Well, does anybody else have any any questions here from Marty? Yeah, Patty. 
Hello, Marty. Seeing okay. is believing. You've done it. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> um, my question is on the, oops. Oh, I just lost everybody. Huh. Uh -oh. Here we we, go. We're, um, we're here. We're still there, here. There you go. Um, are you um, going to be uh, creating the logo for possibly some glasses that we can all have this 10 year? Yeah, that's a good question. That's not a bad idea. You know, we've we've kind of shied away from the tchotchke elements of all the branding stuff. We don't we don't offer hats and t-shirts and polo shirts at our tasting room and but we don't have I would we, use yeah, I would use maybe, the glasses. Yeah, Just, maybe 10th anniversary. Yeah, maybe we can do that. That's a great idea. I'll think about that. That's not a bad idea. Oh, I learned from some old guy about this. Yeah, way back when. <laughs> Thank well, you. Microsoft, all they did was software. I mean, they had to do everything they could to create interest. I mean, this is something actually important. This is wine. Right. Marty, you, you could position it, though, so that, that the long A at the end is right at the, like, five or six ounce mark. And so people... Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, but then our tasting room staff would do five ounce pours, and that's not going to work. So, I, you know, <laughs> what... what, what? Oh. We, haven't, we have enough trouble with that as it is. No, we don't. We, our tasting room staff's awesome. They do a great job. I like that idea, Patty. Though I'll keep, I'll keep fighting for it. There you go. It's on you, Eli. <laughs> right. It doesn't happen. If it doesn't happen, it's, Patty's yeah, coming for you. you know, Ten years—that's a big deal. And like I said, seeing is believing. <laughs> the old Microsoft yeah, Windows idea. introduction. Sure. sure. There you go. <laughs> the roadshow. <laughs> Are you going to give me nightmares now? <sighs> anyway, any other questions, people? Yeah, Mary Margaret. Or sure. and I and it's not fully formed, but um, I I I think about uh, future and growth, and um, I don't know how much efficiency is possible in this business. So when you think about a growth strategy going forward, is it growing club membership? Is it additional lines of different types of wines? Is it distribution? I mean, it, it's probably all of the above, but. Do you have a kind of growth strategy that you've got in your mind now? And, and what kind of factors influence that for you? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, we, we've kind of introduced this Lydian brand, our value brand, as a way of, of exploring what, what the potential is for real growth in terms of uh, quantities. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've I've always believed one of the best assets of, of our organization is really Chris's talents as a winemaker. And, um, you know, to have Chris engaged in making five to 6,000 cases of Avinia wine and now Liminal wine is, is a good, is a really good use of, of his talents and a great, great way to leverage his skill set. And we've also got two really good people in the cellars that, that are doing a fantastic job on the production side. So it frees him up to be, do what he needs to do. But if we can figure out a way uh, through our sales and marketing expertise, which we're growing with Thomas and Eli, to, to create a wine at a lower price point that really shows off Washington and gives Ch Chris a chance to kind of flex his blending and juice acquisition talents, which he has, um, you know, it could be something we could really scale up. And it would be something that wouldn't require a lot more resources from us um, we could uh, just investment in capital because, you know, you've got to invest in the juice or the bulk juice or whatever uh, ahead of time. But then it, then you can turn turn that inventory quicker than if you make the wine yourself. And so the plan with Lydian is to see if we can get traction in our distribution markets. So we're 15 states nationally and we might be adding another three or four this year. And then a, a wine at a, a Washington, a really high quality Washington wine at a $25 price point can be very, very attractive out there. From a from a, a, a you know a sales vo velocity standpoint, more volume, and so in a sense, Lydian is a real growth opportunity for us. Um, 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 and so that's something we're pursuing. The other thing is that you know we are in in a lot of ways the uh, the wines we make now, the Arno, uh, Syrah, the uh, there's a couple of wines that are extremely limited, the the Cabernet Franc uh, from. Um, uh, Shampoo Vineyard and our uh, Valerie, even our Valerie from uh, Boucher and um, Shampoo Vineyards 
um, those are wines that are really limited. And, um, you know, there's only so much we can make. And so we really can't grow those a lot. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to grow Gravira. Uh, could be, you know, we make 600 cases of that now. We could we could we'd probably make more if we could find a, a way to market and distribute that. So there are little niches within the Avinia portfolio that create opportunity. I think Lydian's a bigger growth opportunity. And then Liminal, you know, we're just kind of going to grow with the vineyard there. I mean, we'll see where that goes. Um, you know, Ryan and Cam have a, a pretty ambitious goal to plan out the top of Red Mountain. And there's an opportunity there for us to participate on a strategic level with a few of those wines. But even then, you know, we only bottled 600 cases last year. This year, we bottled maybe 900. And so in the overall scheme of things, it's not a lot. I mean, they're, 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 uh, it, it, it really represented a nice a nice growth for us this last year because it's like adding you know another 20 percent to 25 percent to our overall revenue but um you know how much it's going to grow from there is, is another question so i think lydian's an opportunity um and it really plays to what you know what what could be a real strength of the organization as we grow our distribution skills and chris's blending talents and our our sources and it's really a great way to show off washington fruit i mean it's not just about creating revenue it's also a great way to show off what's possible with washington uh with washington wine i mean it's really a we could we could have a real a real hit with that and you know our our role as a kind of a more specialty producer and not one of the bigger producers might give us a little bit of a leg up in a few markets we'll see so i don't know if that answers your question yeah, it does. Thank you. And I, I, I have a, I don't know if it's a, exactly a follow up. It's kind of a different question. Um, I, I know it, I work in the arts field and the pandemic has been devastating on so many yeah, different absolutely. levels um, for, the, for the folks that I work with. Uh, one of the hopeful signs is the adaptations that people have made during this time that have been innovations that they plan on carrying forward when people are actually able to gather in rooms together again and and mm -hmm. you know do things like in the arts are there things that you as a as a business have experienced as adaptations during this time that are going to benefit you going forward or are you kind of looking to kind of get back to where you were before oh that's a great question i think one of the big adaptations we made is when we were actually able to reopen at 25 percent capacity you know it was kind of a, a little bit of a struggle to get get our team to embrace the open table reservation system and open table really wasn't working with wineries as much as they were for restaurants well they embraced wineries and now my tasting room loves open table man because we can plan uh, capacity and so that that is going to stay i mean people make reservations to come into our tasting room um, so that's going to stay I think we've also um, learned that um, um, pickup events can be very successful if you can give people an opportunity to try the wine. So we may or may not continue our sample bottle strategy as we go forward. Um, you know, the, the, one of the things that I've really loved about uh, being involved in Avenia is we do these pickup events and we do these wonderful parties and we, and we support artists and we support chefs and we support restaurants and we, and we gather we gather as a community of people and I'm a big gatherer. I love to gather. And um, I'm hoping that people, you know, sometime next year or later this year will be willing to come into these events again, because I really do love that. But, you know, if people are gonna be reluctant, we might look at accommodations. So if people wanna participate in our events, they can participate, you know, remotely or independently. We'll see how that goes. Um, but we've had, we've had a lot of fun um, Supporting arts, we supported a couple of arts organizations, KPC and the Royal Room down in South Seattle by hosting, using them to host uh, streamed music shows. We're doing another one coming up here in a couple of weeks uh, with a great artist, uh, Paul uh, Benoit, who uh, is a terrific songwriter, singer and blues artist. Um, and uh, he's gonna do a show from KPC that we're gonna stream. Um, and so we, we, that's one of the things that I believe firmly in is, is the role of arts in the community. So I've enjoyed supporting, you know, the arts as much as we can. So we'll continue to do that for sure. I, th I think you, there's some, when you were talking about the whole Sistina, uh, you know, derivation and stuff like that, I, th I think there's some amazing opportunities for some arts connection through, yeah. through that whole piece. So thank you very cool. much. 
Cool. One of the things that we didn't talk about was that it was when we started of any in 2010, we're celebrating the 10th vintage. 2010 was one of the coldest years in the history of Washington state wine growing. And, you know, it was the middle of a recession, uh, you know, for those, you know, those kids out there, you may not remember this, but, um, you know, the, the stock market crash, the tech boom was over and, you know, the vines are freezing all across the Eastern Washington and, and Chris and I are starting a winery. And I, I, I remember there are a couple of points where I turned and says, well, shoot, Chris, if we can make it this year, <laughs> we can make it anywhere. And then 2011 came around and it was even colder. And so the first two vintages of Aveni wines actually are, are, were play super well into Chris's style, which is, you know, uh, more restrained, not big over the top fruit, not overly opulent. opulent more uh and we harvest we harvest our fruit a little bit early most of the time because we don't like a lot of sugar and and overblown flavors and we like uh and so uh the first two vintages actually played into our hands pretty well and then from there off and running the 2012 was an astounding vintage uh followed only by i think 2018 is probably the next best vintage for our wines that we've we've had the scores have just been off the charts for the 18 year but um if you want to know, we, you know, Chris has done a, an aging, age and drinkability charts available on the website. So you can, you can go in and, and, and pick, you know, if you've got a seller and you've got these wines, you can uh, kind of see what are ready to go. Yeah. Well, this has been so great. Um, it's, we're right near that time where I, I want to wrap things up. I also apologize if you hear some helicopter noises i think people are working on the roof above me so that's why there's some no way <laughs> but um but that's okay um i just yeah so before before we send off marty and joe a couple of housekeeping things so next week um we're gonna be next week next thursday is earth day so we're gonna talk about uh climate change and how that affects the wine industry as a whole and what sort of people all around the world are doing to to adapt and mitigate and and, and help in that in that effort um so that's gonna be really interesting. Um, a reminder too, if you're ever interested in follow up after any, I do a blog post after each um, episode. After each, we post the video that has unanswered questions or or fact check because a lot of times I get things wrong. So I want to make sure you guys have the right information. Uh, so make sure to check that, especially the music one because we actually included a Spotify playlist so you can listen to some of the music we paired with wines. Uh, and then even just a tiny little update. I read an article this morning. If you were here on the wine fraud, the sour grapes episode. They just deported Rudy Kurniawan back to Indonesia like two weeks ago. So as just like a follow-up, it's it's really interesting story. Well um, done, Eli. Good job. Yeah, right? We did it. <laughs> you did it. You did it. <laughs> but anyway, so that's so just to keep an eye out for for more uh, more content that way. But um, but thanks again, Marty, Joe, thank you so much for for joining and giving us a little more of the background and story behind all this. Uh, it's been fantastic. You bet. Thanks, Eli. Bye. Thanks for having me, Eli. Thanks. And uh, so cheers to everyone and, and Marty, happy birthday. Oh, oh, you said you wouldn't do it. No, I said I wouldn't sing to you. That was the problem. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and thank thanks. you. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next week. Thank, thank you. Cheers. Bye, everyone. Bye.